Once again, for your entire family, the lyrical, light-hearted entertainment of Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Magic milk on the wall. Who is the fairest one of all? Featuring those beguiling Disney characters loved by everyone. And of course, this is Grumpy. Mush. Here's Doc. <laughs> why, why, yeah? And Bashful. Oh. It's ticklish business any way you look at it. Come on, we'll stick together. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ticklish Business. I'm Kristen, as always, joined by the fantabulous Emily. It's our last episode of 2023. But we are going out with a bang talking about Disney Centennial and the 1937 animated feature Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. And we are joined by a Disney expert, my friend slash coworker, Drew Taylor. Drew, how are you? I'm just feeling so lucky to be here. Thank you both so much. I'm so excited. It's the centennial. How have you both been celebrating? I mean, I went to Disneyland probably more than is necessary and spent a lot of money. I gave them what they wanted. Yeah, you did your part. Emily, yeah. what did you do for the centennial? Okay, is this where I humble brag, Kristen? Because my husband is a composer. You remember the Super Bowl commercial that happened with the Disney 100? My husband wrote the music to that. So oh, that's, that's so cool. Kind of launched the whole thing. Yeah, that's amazing. I remember you telling me he was doing that. And I also think you said you were very sick of hearing it after a while. <laughs> that's fair. But before we get to talking about Snow White, we would like to briefly remind everyone that if you haven't checked out our Patreon at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz, you should. We do additional bonus pods, including double features, looking at remakes based on a true podcast, looking at biopics and true crime. We also just finished our first season of But Have You Read the series. We did our last episode looking at the dueling versions of Jane Eyre. And things got very funny. We also give out regular care packages of movies and gifts and let you guest on an episode. That's at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Fun thing I also keep forgetting to remind people of, if you are a patron and you head over to Spotify and you search Ticklish Business, you will find not only access to these shows via Spotify, but all of the bonus content is available to listen to via Spotify. That is only for patrons. So you should check that out. We also have our great Christmas prize pack that we're giving away. We're giving away two huge prize packs that include our famous Makoko mugs, as well as a tote bag and two signed copies of my book. But have you read the book as well as free coffee from Breakfast at Dominique's. So if you are interested in winning one of those, Please be sure to follow us both on our social media at Instagram and Twitter. Find out more over there. Don't forget that Emily and I are both authors. You can order our books wherever you get books. And our Redbubble store has some fabulous art designed by Samantha Ellis Richardson. That's what I'm calling her now. As well as Terrence Hiltz featuring your favorite stars, including those popular Makoko mugs. If you can't win one through our contest, you can always buy one. You can find that at ticklishbiz.redbubble.com. Disney 100 and Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. If you don't know the story, which honestly, I don't know how anybody doesn't know the story. It's about a princess whose stepmother wants to kill her. So she flees to the woods where she finds a group of seven little people and breaks into their house. They decide to keep her. Until the witch finds her again and all hell breaks loose. It's a very simple 90 minute movie. I have very mixed feelings about Snow White. And that is not including the fact that they're going to remake it next year. And Rachel Zegler has a lot of opinions about it. Shout out, I'm team Rachel Zegler. So let her say whatever she wants. But I rewatched the movie for this show. I'm interested to get Drew's thoughts because I know he's a real expert on this. But the animation... And the process of making this movie just transcends any content issues that I would have because it is just fabulous. And I watched this on Disney+. Plus. I don't know how recent the restoration for this was, but it looks flippin' amazing to watch and notice all of the fine technical details that no doubt they had a hell of a time working with in 1937. That restoration is brand new. It's from earlier this year. It was a 4K disc before it went on Disney+. Plus. 
It looks amazing. I mean, all of the old guard Disney animators that are still at the studio, people like Eric Goldberg and Mark Henn helped out on that restoration. There have been restorations in the past that I think haven't looked as good as this new 4K version, but it's really pretty astounding. It is a real technical marvel and also the kind of the key text to the Disney story, at least the early Disney story. It began sort of 10 years into the studio at a time when short films were flagging in popularity and financial success. It was a real question mark. A lot of people really didn't think he could do it. And the fact that he did and the fact that he made such an artistically captivating work is really telling. It's pretty astounding, even today. Emily, I know you come to us often as the novice, but no doubt you've seen this movie several times before. What do you think of it? I was surprised again while seeing the restoration, because I'm sure the last time I saw it was probably on like 1980s Disney Channel or perhaps something VHS taped off of the last time it ever appeared on television. So it was ancient and cruddy and lousy. But it is a truly beautiful movie. I was obsessed with all of the details that were peppered into the house that she found in the woods with all the animals carved in and the incredibly rich detail that was included in all of the background and the color composition. And it was just a truly mind-bendingly artistic movie because I don't feel as though... Quite a lot of animation might get that much detail and attention, at least during my heyday of watching animation, you know, like the 80s and 90s. You barely had people's mouths line up with what they were saying. And this is just a stunningly gorgeous movie that was so compelling to watch, even though it's an interesting form of storytelling that feels really old. And I'll probably circle back to that at some point. It's fascinating too to watch the movie from just a film standpoint, having seen so many modern films. The multi-plane camera that they invented for this movie to get those really interesting close-ups, like the opening sequence with the castle and they push beyond the woods into the castle. That is thrilling to see because most of the, even a lot of the Disney shorts had a very static camera where maybe you're panning from left to right, but you're not really going into the frame. And you get that a lot. There's so many modern cinematic techniques. I mean, movies themselves were still very much in their infancy, but they had proceeded to go beyond being retellings of plays they've gone beyond the proscenium arch to see that in an animated cartoon i can only imagine what audiences in 1937 were thinking that first time they do the zoom in or even the sequence at the wishing well where you have all these different layers of the camera and you have the foreground with the characters and you have the background there is such depth and it feels so contemporary to the films of the era You can watch this alongside something like Gold Diggers of 1933, and they feel both representative of that decade. That technological challenge was something that he was really looking to engage with because he felt he had hit a wall with the shorts. And there had been a couple of shorts released that same year that had the multiplane to kind of like test it out. One of them is The Old Mill, which is one of the more famous Disney shorts. This was a real feat. And what's interesting, too, is that He had been approached with other stories at the time to make the first feature, and he didn't feel like they were ready technologically yet for something like Bambi. And there was a, you will appreciate this, Kristen, there was a Mary Pickford Alice in Wonderland that he was approached with that that she wanted to, to be a hybrid. He didn't think he could do that yet. It's a really astounding piece of technology. And even the fact that it was a feature length film, there was skepticism about who would show up to the premiere to a feature length movie. He had kind of set people up for it because there used to be exhibitions where there would be a lot of shorts that would just be shown for an hour and a half. And he stopped those in 1934 to get people ready for the movie. And so that people weren't going to think that it was just a bunch of things that weren't connected, all stapled together. Of course, during World War II, he had to do those types of movies. But at the time, it was really unproven and really uh, interesting that that went out that way. What is also unique about this, and Disney as a figure is such a controversial person, whether it's looking at elements of how he responded to unions. But what I'm always amazed by is that he had the 
mogul in him. Adriana Casalotti was the voice of Snow White in this movie. She was 16. She was very young when she made the film. She was essentially a Nepo baby. She had connections to the studio and she got the part. And she was a classically trained singer. She's got a lovely voice. From what I've been told from people that have met her as she aged, she kept speaking in the Snow White voice up until her 80s. They said it was very weird. Disney wanted to emphasize that this was a once in a lifetime thing. So he signed Adriana Casalotti to a very, very strict contract that prohibited her from doing anything else. She has a brief little vocal cameo in Wizard of Oz. If you've seen the Wizard of Oz when the Tin Man is singing his song and it's the Wherefore Art Thou Romeo, that's Adriana Casalotti. But she didn't do really anything else. They said she came back and re-recorded the Wishing Well sequence at Disneyland for the 83 redo of New Fantasyland. But she became indelibly identified with Snow White, not to keep bringing up Rachel Zegler, but to be identified as Snow White forever in your professional career and not do anything else. Ooh, I feel for this poor woman. How can you top that, though, to be the voice in the very first animated feature? True, very true. I've seen the reference footage, the reference photos that they've done where they would have the actress dress up in the outfit and recreate scenes so that they could animate around her. No disrespect, Adriana Casalotti had very strong features. I don't necessarily know if she was going to be our next Greta Garbo, but it is funny that Part of the reason she did not transcend that role was Disney himself wanting to emphasize that this was an event, even so far as having the performers stuck with Disney. And that would eventually become a problem with a lot of other actors as the animated films would go on. Yeah, we were a long way from Billy Joel, (laughs) Robin Williams. Adriana Casalotti is fascinating if you look at her in the context of, and not to get somber 15 minutes into the podcast, but compared to Bobby Driscoll or your Tommy Kirks, other actors who very much chafed at the Disney mentality of filmmaking. And really, she is the one name I think that most people remember. And I say that because there were a lot of other Disney regulars like Pinto Holvig, who was the voice of Goofy, was the voice of Grumpy. Lucille Laverne, who is the voice of the Queen, also had a distinguished career. But Adriana Casalotti, she's a Jeopardy question in a lot of ways, which it's a mixed vibe because I think she makes the character so good. Snow White can be a little annoying as a character. She's so sweet. She's so innocent. She's got that Betty Boop voice. And we're going to talk about how 30s the animation is in this. I would have liked to have seen her do anything else just to see if she could do anything else. That is interesting. It's not a great part of the Snow White story, for sure. I was reading up on Snow White earlier today. I was looking at Neil Gabler's great Walt Disney biography. good one. Which- He says that Douglas Fairbanks contacted Disney beforehand about doing a Gulliver's Travel animated movie as the first movie. So in the sense that there was this woman who was a no-name and then was locked into it. In the multiverse, there's a version where he worked with the biggest star, one of the biggest stars of all time on the very first one. And I wonder how that would have affected the Disney animated pipeline going forward. If that would have been some hallmark of the future movies going forward. Having Disney work with Doug and Mary would have been utterly bonkers. Walt had done some of the Alice comedies before, which blended a live action actress with the animated stuff. And and Mary Pickford rode the train of playing a child until she was 36. But she did it very well. If anything, I don't think Walt would have necessarily liked to have shared the prestige of it. If he had worked with Fairbanks or Pickford, it would have been Pickford and Disney or Fairbanks and Disney. I don't think Walt wanted to have an and. It's Walt Disney's Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I don't think he wanted to share any credit. Gabler posits that Snow White is very much the story of Walt Disney as well. In that it has that hardworking ethos. There was a troubled childhood that he transcended. All of that stuff is in the movie, which I think is interesting. He might not have been able to get the deal that he got in terms of distribution. He might not have been able to have as much of the back end that he ended up having, which I know we're kind of jumping forward, but ended up producing the money that built the studio in Burbank and got him out of hot water because at the time they really didn't have much money at the studio. 
the margin on those shorts was very slim, apparently. It could have affected everything, really. You're right, if there had been a big star attached. Yeah, and Disney, for the most part, kept out of having big names in his animated films, at least for a really long time. The Jungle Book is the first time I remembered having a big George Sanders playing the voice of Shere Khan. Now and it's Louis just... Prima, yeah. Walt really cast a lot from the TV Guide. It worked well, and it certainly was not very expensive. But yeah, I think you're right, that Jungle Book. And then going forward with Rescuers, everybody... Eva Gabor, really yeah, Eva, Eva, Gabor, Eva Gabor, yeah, Bob yeah, Newhart, Gabor, yeah. yeah. That was a threshold movie. And then obviously Katzenberg in the 80s was obsessed with celebrities. That's when you really got into it. Like we were talking about, Oliver and Company is just full of people. But and Oliver yeah. and Company is the worst Disney animated film. I mean, I know a lot of people say Home on the Range. Home on the Range is not good, but Oliver and Company is not good as well. It's my hot take. I miss voice actors. I miss actors whose job it was to be vocal performers first. It's something that I wish we had more of. Snow White is really a testament to voice performers because so many of the performances here are just fantastic. I mean, Lucille Laverne as the queen, this was her last role ever. She'd been making movies since the teens. She's probably most close identify with this she did a lot of movies in the 30s it's like woman on a train uncredited and she is so great at playing both the queen as this regal sophisticated woman i love the way that the women are dressed in this movie because it's very 30s you have the sweet girl with the flowy dress and the little puff sleeves it's very medieval but very modern And then you have Lucille Laverne, who is pure 30s bombshell. She's dressed like Jean Harlow, pretty much in that tight, very straight dress with the cape. And she doesn't have hair. She's got this weird little covering over her head. The eye makeup is very extravagant. It's like she's going to dinner at eight. It is very deco, which I appreciate. And then when you get the old hag performance, she's able to just sell it. You are mystified every time she's on the screen. And I think the movie has a lot of fun with her. As a character, even though she is not in the movie a whole heck of a lot, I was really thrown watching at this time how much Walt seems to enjoy reveling in the comedic elements of this. We get really long extended sequences where the dwarves are washing their hands and they got to sing a song about it. Or they're all sleeping in the house because Snow White takes the bed. So you have to see how they're all sleeping. You really don't get a whole lot of story. I mean, not that there is much of a story to Snow White, but we do get to see the elements that made him famous from the short standpoint with the comedic elements to it. It seemed like a lot of it was just stringing together of bits, which is totally fine. You could see how he was playing with how are we going to play with attention spans, but also so many of the seven were vaudeville performers too. So they were used to doing things in chunks in order to get a laugh and setting up for the next laugh. And I think it works really, really well. I enjoyed it, especially for someone who is coming back to this relatively new. I don't watch a whole lot of animated Disney and certainly not the early animated Disney's. It worked really well. And the last, I want to say like earlier Disney that I watched was Alice in Wonderland. And that is just chapters of books strung together. And If I went back and watched Bambi, it would also be very similar. We lead up to a problem, solve the problem, and then we lead up to the next problem and solve the problem, which is a perfectly valid way of telling stories for what is considered now a kid's movie, but was certainly an all ages movie back then. First of all, we have to say, obviously, animation is art. Animation transcends its audience. And yes, everyone should be watched. Kristen knows how much animation I watch to this day. The thing about story, Kristen, because... He apparently bought the rights to several different adaptations of Snow White because he was worried about people suing him. He says that he was really influenced by the 1916 version, which for a long time was totally lost. And he saw it in 1917 in Kansas City when they did some promotion for newspaper boys. They showed it to 67,000 newspaper boys in Kansas City, and they had to set up this rig with four projectors. So Walt was looking over into another screen to see what was coming, and he says that it was one of the most profound childhood experiences of his life. What's interesting, too, is that there was a lot more Seven Dwarfs goofing off stuff that didn't make it into the movie. There's this famous scene where they're eating soup, 
that they restored a few years ago that somebody found in the archive. They're dealing with the comedic backbone of the shorts, but also trying to tell a longer story that'll sustain 80 whatever minutes. I'm upset that we don't get that plot line in Newsies of them all watching the 1916 Snow White. I that would, need to you're see right. That, that would have been great. Really easy opportunity for a nice little callback yeah. instead of all of the rampant ableism that's in that movie. I say that it's somebody that unabashedly loves Newsies. The comedic elements are great because I love the shorts. There are so many of the Disney shorts that are iconic on their own. And just the little bits of business that we get in an animated film where you are drawing all of this by hand, there's no economy spared in anything. So we get that sequence with Sleepy and the fly where the fly is buzzing his nose and then we see the fly settle down on his nose and go to sleep. It's very cute. The hand washing sequence and the way that the dwarf's hands are, their faces. These are things that necessarily don't need to be animated, but they add a level of verisimilitude to the characters that makes you care about them. I never realized before how Dopey, who is our nonverbal character, although they make a point of saying it's not that he can't speak physically, it's just that he never had anything he wanted to say. Which, okay, you know what? Score one for Walt for trying to get around that question there. But he's so expressive just the way his ears move or the way he trips over his clothes. These are things that you would think of for a physical actor. We don't have that. And yet they're treating these characters as if they are physical performers, which, damn, that is really cool. On the new 4K disc, there's this special feature of just quotes that Walt was giving the press at the time. And he said, with every laugh, there must be a tear, which I'm not sure if that math totally checks out with Snow White, but also brings up the fact that all the animators and all the writers and everything were all self-taught. It's very much like Pixar in the sense that when Toy Story came out, they were not writers or directors or anything. They were animators and they were mathematicians and technology guys. So it's a very interesting one-to-one. -one. Obviously, Toy Story was such a groundbreaking feature in that it was the first computer animated feature versus the first just feature-length animated film. But I thought those were interesting parallels in that production. Have you joined Ticklish Biz's Patreon yet? Well, you should, just like Allie Moore, Amy Hart, Andrew Hoppy, Christine Meyer, Danny, David Floyd, Donna Hill, Gates, Jacob Haller, Jonathan Watkins, Kimberly, Krista Painter, and Mick F. Listen to episodes 48 hours early, receive exclusive membership items, and even guest on an episode. You also get access to entire bonus series like Based on a True Podcast, Doubled Features, and our new limited series, But Have You Read the The Series? It's all at patreon.com slash ticklishbiz. Back to the show. My favorite part of watching Snow White was actually clocking all the things that were reused in future movies. Dopey's garments and his sleeves are very Mickey in The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And then you have a Snow White dancing with, I don't remember which one, and that's clearly Maid Marian and Robin Hood, which is my favorite Disney movie. I'm not an Easter egg person. I usually don't watch movies to go, oh, I recognize that. I recognize that. But it was really fun for me to be able, with the limited Disney vocabulary that I have, be able to see how they reused animation or whatever technology they do to do that in future movies. And I just thought that was really interesting to the process of animation. That stuff is interesting. And, and you'll have a lot of different points of view on that recycling stuff, which was implemented after Walt passed away. The animators would say this is just as hard to redo these scenes as it is to do something new. But at the time, it was after Walt had died, nobody really knew what to do, and they were asking themselves, how do we make this as good as what Walt would have done? Fantasia is such a fascinating breakthrough in and of itself. I could see them wanting just to use that same kind of visual language for The Sorcerer's Apprentice, which is so powerful. This is the bedrock in so many ways to everything that would come after, including... Kristen's favorite movie, Wish, that just came out for the 100th. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, many, many callbacks to Snow White. Kristen, do you want to talk about that? Bless you for thinking I remember specific callbacks from that movie, which I don't. So I'm going to have you tell me what they were. I mean, the biggest one is that the main character, Asha, has seven friends that are approximations of the seven dwarves. There's also a very cool moment towards the end of the movie that harkens back to the mirror, the magic mirror. There's an actual frame from Snow White in Wish that would have probably counted as a spoiler if anyone had seen it, but we'll just say that it's there. <laughs> so, Emily, talk about the visual vocabulary of Snow White being transposed to a new style. That is it, big time in Wish. 
Also, to go back to just the look of the movie, too, what I always notice is the differentiating between the different characters. So Snow White's face is very delicate and round. She's got Cupid doll features. I'm assuming Betty Boop was right around this time because she looks very similar to Betty Boop. And even the prince who doesn't warrant a name, I think he has a name. No, no. The first prince with the name is Sleeping Beauty, right? Yeah. Yeah. So screw the prince from this movie and Cinderella. We don't give them names. But he's also got very soft boy features, very round face. Yet the dwarves have such expression You can tell them apart. And even Lucille Laverne and the Huntsman, they all have very defined features. And yet Snow White is almost the most easily animated of the group. She's got the very round face, with the little bump of a nose, small lips. It's intriguing that that's what they put all of the expressive elements into the other characters as opposed to Snow White herself. The dwarves are so caricatured that I feel like the animators felt a lot more at home. Bambi was brought to Walt and he thought that he couldn't do it realistically at the time. Even having humans that look realistic, which we've also seen in Pixar, that took them so long to do, really until The Incredibles, which was almost a decade after Toy Story came out, that they had realistic humans. There's also those great stories about how the ink and paint department was largely female. I'd say probably 100% female. And they would actually put their blush on Snow White. So that those cheeks are from their blush as they were painting the cells for Snow White, which is pretty fascinating. So there is character. Maybe it's, it's from the people that were painting her. It's there. It's there. Emily and I were talking about the original Grimm story before this. If anything, I urge people to read the original Grimm's fairy tales version of Snow White just to get how chaotic that original story is. I always laugh when I watch this movie. The apple is what everybody remembers. And I'm not going to lie. The animation on that apple is flawless. Just the creation of it is probably my favorite sequence where she's putting the whole thing together. But when you read the original Grimm story, the witch took a couple of tries before she got to actually something that would work. She's using these really feminine beauty products to try to get Snow White to succumb to the poison. So there's a hair comb that she uses that's dipped in poison. And my personal favorite is there's a ribbon that she's tying around her neck that somehow gets tied too tight and causes her to almost asphyxiate. And then the apple thing happens and that takes. I wish that maybe some of those elements had been included. I get why they're not. But the original tale is bonkers. It's worth a read alongside watching the movie. He deemed it that it was not plot heavy enough. And I guess that he did borrow things. There was a stage production that had a lot of the things that are iconic in this movie, like her kissing the dwarves goodnight was from this earlier stage production, which again, he got the rights to. The Evil Queen is interesting because she really is the most iconic part of the movie in a lot of ways. She outlived the story even when they would re-release Snow White every seven years theatrically up until the late 80s. There would be things like Halloween specials that would feature the cauldron scene. There was one that was hosted by the Magic Mirror played by noted sex criminal Jeffrey Jones. Yeah, so that stuff has really transcended. Even the ride at Disneyland, before they redid it, you were in the place of Snow White and it was all about the evil queen and all these horrible things happening. It's pretty interesting how she is the icon of this movie in a lot of ways. Is that why I can't find the original Disney Halloween treat with the talking mask anywhere on the internet? Is because I think the guy that's actually played... not. It's one of the first ones. It's still on YouTube. They're all okay. on YouTube. There was the magic mirror and then there was kind of a pumpkin character that pumpkin. would come later. There's also a great DTV Halloween compilation that had music videos like John Oates. No, not John Oates. Uh, Daryl Hall's solo work is in that. I wish they would put those things on Disney Plus. It would be a lot of fun. Every year I wait for Disney Halloween Treat to be up on there so I can show my husband what I grew up watching on Halloween and it's never there. It's never just there. Just do a quick, just do a quick YouTube search oh, and uh, miraculously it remains. I don't know if the Jeffrey Jones of it is the reason why. It's all stuff that they had. I mean, the DTV stuff would be hard to clear all the music, but it's pretty fascinating how just those clips lived on for so long. People who had no idea what Snow White was and maybe hadn't even seen it saw those those Halloween specials. 
that's where I appreciate the movie as, as a work of art because it really has outlived and created this whole method of entertainment that is so iconic in its own right. I watch this and I look at Disney films today and not to kick a kid while they're down, but to watch this and look at Disney now, people have a lot of thoughts on all of that. They're going to remake this movie next year in a live action format that I'm very, very skeptical about. No doubt this is a 90 minute movie that they will somehow stretch to two and a half hours. I don't know. I know they're going to make really dumb choices about modernizing it that nobody asked for, like dumping all the songs because they're all about a guy. But what I was surprised I was not irritated by watching this movie is the dwarf element to it. Are so many feelings about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves from a disabled standpoint and a lot of mixed feelings about the story and the characters. But watching this iteration, and again, it's why I pointed out the whole Dopey's not mute. He just doesn't want to talk. He just never learned how is what they're saying. He's essentially Timothy Chalamet's character in Wonka. He just didn't know how to do all those things. That's a really slick little turn of phrase that as a disabled person watching that, I don't know, maybe Walt didn't even realize he was doing that, but it's a really interesting way of skirting the issue of disability. That being said, the dwarves, that's how they're referred to. I would call them little people. They live in a house that is accessible for them, which is great. They have a steady job making mad money in a diamond mine. For the most part, they just want Snow White as a maid and to cook. If anything, they're in a power position. <laughs> I was not bothered by it because of the animation, because it's animated. Making it live action and knowing that they tried very hard to retcon what they were. Oh, they're magical creatures. And then they put out the first picture and it's like, no, it's CGI little people. You probably just shrunk down actors to make them like, stop it. You lied to me. You just lied to my face. That's why the animation works. Animation can actually undo a lot of questionable content. Because it's animated. I wasn't as bothered. I'm not actually as irritated by this as I thought I would be from that standpoint. Is it true that they made them dwarves because in the original story, they were supposed to be monks living in the thing and they thought it would be odd for a young girl to go and spend a couple of nights in a house with seven monks? I don't know if that's accurate. I don't know. Kristen, is that the original story? Are they monks? I only remember the weird ribbon death and the comb. I don't actually remember who she was living with. Tales change depending on what edition you're reading, too. One, and I mean, there's been so many iterations of this story since that have also been live action, even though it stars problematic people. Mirror Mirror is a very good iteration of this story that I thoroughly enjoy that has really great costumes. I recommend nobody saw that when it came out in 2011. Go watch it. It's really good. And it casts authentically. Good for them. Just ignore the army hammer of it all. We've had so many versions of Snow White, Disney going back to the well at this point. Clearly not going to have the same impact as the original 1937 film, but I don't know. I have a lot of mixed feelings about it. I feel a thing for it, and I'm not sure what it is yet. It's interesting you bring up her role, too, because they are weirdly infantilized. They're a lot like the Lost Boys in a lot of ways from Peter Pan, where this grown woman comes in or a grown woman to them and they look to her to sort out their business but she's the mother um, she's yeah. the mother right yeah exactly but it's also like these are men these are men with facial hair and a physically demanding job it'll be interesting to see how they pull that off in this new one and that was the other thing i noticed she comes into the house in this and she says oh there must be seven children that live here and then once she realizes that they're not children she's like oh you're men that's great. And yet she still proceeds to be an ableist and tell them to wash their hands, get ready for dinner. And I would be like, ma'am, I have a pension. There's You're something... the one who broke into my home. There's something that a lot of these stories do, whether or not it's in the myth or in the adaptations of it. And Wendy is a perfect example of they have girls undergo their sexual awakening by being a mother figure to someone first. That's sort of what happens with Wendy is that she gets taken for this huge joy ride into Never Never Land. And she's a mother figure to all of these lost boys. And then she has a sexual awakening in the book towards Peter, where she's like, oh, we're husband and wife. We're the parents to these children. And Peter freaks out and is like, uh, 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 and sends her back to London. 
And then in this, this is she runs away from the prince the first time she sees him, the first time he sees her singing into the wishing well. And she's like, this ain't good. I have no idea what to do with this hunky, hunky man who's showing attention to me. She runs off to the woods, becomes a mother figure to these seven little men. And then she, when she wakes up, she's like, oh, wait, I can actually go back with the prince now because I understand what is expected of me in order to be like a mother fulfilling figure. So it's weird, but that's how the story works. I love the analytical decision making that goes into the scripting of this movie, too. I didn't remember that the witch's plan is she's going to eat the apple and die. She knows what is going to undo the spell. She knows it's love's first kiss. And she says, well, no chance of that happening because once she is considered dead, they'll bury her alive. And I thought that was a really inventive way to skirt around. The woman knows that there is a way to undo this and is anticipating an outcome that never happens, A, because they offer before all that, and B, because it says even in death, which I do love that they have to put little text. I'm assuming they back themselves into a corner and we're like, how are we going to explain this? We'll just go the silent movie route and we'll put text up that says in death, she was so beautiful. They were like, we can't bury you. I guess the spell didn't allow her to decompose or anything, but I'm assuming she wakes up after what, a week? She's probably not smelling great. That's all scripting decisions that you don't necessarily need to include, and yet they do. Did you like that text at the beginning that thanked all the animators for their hard work? I thought that yeah. was so great. <laughs> He didn't know what was around the corner with the animator's strike of 1941, but he was trying to keep everybody contained. Walt, in these audio clips they have on the Blu-ray, says that 50% of my time was in the sweat box, which is where the animation is actually going on, and then 50% he was focused on story. And so he must have been shuttling back and forth between the story department and the animators trying to stitch everything up in a way that felt satisfying. And I'm sure, Kristen, that that came up and that they were like, ah, we'll put a text card in there. We don't want to animate this explanation. You were wondering how the live action version is going to get to be the requisite two and a half hours long. Some falling action might be nice because that was the thing I was trying to think of earlier in this episode when you asked me what I thought of it. Man, this movie just ends in a way that modern movies don't do. We always get some sort of happy resolution. Her Prince Charming came to get her. They smooched. She's on a horse and off they go to Neuschwanstein and that's it. I was really surprised that the movie just ends. Listen, they got in, they got out. Everybody was happy. Nobody had seen anything. And we all remember that final moment too. It's not like it just peters out. That was a nice little button. It's pretty efficient for all of its dwarves washing their hands for seven minutes. Well, and it's also much like the movies of the era that just end because you don't get closing credits. I don't know when closing credits became a thing in movies, but up until the 19, like 50s or 60s, you'd get the opening credits and then the movie would just end which I do appreciate that run times were accurate. The movie ends at this time and it is ending. None of this take off 10, 15 minutes for closing credits. I'm interested to see how this remake plays out because it's going to be weirdness all around. I want to start wrapping this up. Closing thoughts on Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. I liked it a lot more than I thought I would. I probably saw this for the most recently before this up in maybe about 10 years ago when I made a plan to watch all the Disney animated movies in sequence. It's been a minute, but it still is utterly breathtaking. It is a work of art. The 4K restoration on Disney Plus is utterly beautiful. I really appreciate this movie. The plot is 1937. It's a 1937 animated movie. You can't really complain and nitpick about much of it. So it's lovely. It is just a lovely movie. And I don't think we describe films like that enough. Emily, final thoughts on Snow White. I have to admit that I come at this from a very weird angle of just, I love storybook architecture. And to know that much of the dwarves housing was basically drawn because there were storybook homes within essentially line of sight of the animator studio. And that was something I picked up while living in LA really, really early on, that little tidbit of fact. And just to see how that permeated through our concept of story and storytelling and fantasy. It was an absolutely beautiful visual thread through all of animation. And I just think of all ways to start out 
it's a pretty good one. It's it's gorgeous. It's a lovely, lovely, lovely movie to echo you, Kristen. Rue, take us out. Final thoughts well, on Snow yeah, White. The lovely part too also has to do with they were making this movie during the Great Depression too. And they really wanted to give people an escape into something that was really, really lush. And they also knew that they weren't going to make any money if people didn't want to spend however many minutes in the theater with this one story. I love it. It's probably my least favorite of that early batch. The fact that Pinocchio was next and is such a masterpiece. Pinocchio is the greatest animated feature ever and one of the great movies ever. But to have Pinocchio and Fantasia follow up is pretty amazing. You can tell that they got that confidence boost. Yes, we can do this. This is not Disney's folly. It made so much money. They built the studio. And they didn't rest on their laurels. They didn't make Snow White Part 2 as the next movie. They really branched out and experimented, went for it. Fantasia didn't actually break even 50 years. But they were always trying. And this is a great first step towards that amazing legacy of Disney animation. Yeah, I'm really, really scared about the live action one because, good Lord, these live action movies are a chore. To fritter away their crown jewel would be a real shame. But you know what? Mark Webb, we love him. He's just a master. There's nothing to worry about. Drew, what you're saying is we need to have you back to talk about Pinocchio. Yes, I would love to come back to talk about Pinocchio. We could talk about Fantasia. There's much to discuss. The movies made during the war are fascinating. Anytime, I will be here. Drew, thank you so much for coming on and talking with us about Disney and the 1930s and weird remakes, all of that wish. <laughs> Feel free to let people know where they can find you online and anything you have coming up. It's Drew Tailored, like a tailored shirt on Instagram, Twitter, wherever. You can read me on The Wrap with Kristen. If you're into Mission Impossible, I should say, come on over to Light the Fuse, where we have new episodes every week about the Mission Impossible franchise. Always talking about animation somewhere and to have some fun animation stuff coming out this year. So do give me a follow. That is going to close out Ticklish Business for today. This is actually our last episode of 2023. We have some great bonus content that is going to be made available to all of our regular listeners. You can still find us online. We'll be all over social media. Everything else will be active. We'll be back in 2024 before I get into the closing stuff. It's been a great year, Emily. I mean, we've done pretty good this year. We're excited for 2024. I'm very excited for 2024. Thank you so much for having me on the show. And it's just been an absolute blast to learn from you and Samantha and talk to all of the guests that you managed to put together. Your roster is incredible. And everybody has been so cool and welcoming. And it's been really, really great to interact with the community too. Everybody is really, really sweet and just really excited to be here. And I'm really excited for my first full year next year. We are already planning 2024. We have a great, incredibly lengthy doc that we're looking at for ideas. We might be soliciting people to help us decide between some of those ideas. We'll be back at the end of January after taking a much deserved break and ready for whatever 2024 lobs at us. That's going to close us out for today. Of course, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews matter. So leave us one on Apple Podcasts. Five stars, please. We are on all social media, Twitter at ticklish underscore biz, as well as Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at ticklish biz. You can follow me at therap.com, as well as on all social media at kristenlopez88. Emily Edwards is at Ms. Emily Edwards on all social media as well. Our Patreon helps keep the lights on at Ticklish Biz HQ and gives us chances to do all sorts of new content like our But Have You Read the series, as well as some great interviews and more video content we have planned for 2024. So consider helping us out at patreon.com slash Ticklish Biz. Please remember, if you're listening through Spotify to search for the Ticklish Business RSS feed, if you are a patron, you can listen to all of the bonus content directly through Spotify. And I don't also advertise this enough, but if you are ever looking for an old episode, we have our entire archive of episodes going all the way back to episode one at ticklishbusiness.podbean.com. That's our entire archive. And it's free. You can listen to all of the episodes over there. And Emily and I are authors. We have our books out. I have, but have you read the book? 
Emily has her Viviana Valentine Girl Friday Mysteries. Those are wherever you can buy books. Please buy them, especially this holiday season. We will have our first hiatus episode coming out on January 3rd. So please be listening for that. But we will be back with all new episodes January 31st, 2024. We wish everybody a happy and safe holiday and a great new year. Till then. 